Thank you, guys. <clears throat> uh, we'd like to begin with a word of welcome. Uh, appreciate all of you being here today, and I know we've got some visitors today, some new faces, uh, new and old, and um, appreciate you starting your year off with us. And so today, we're going to be embarking on a new study, actually two new studies, uh, during the CT time, the Sunday school time, we call it CT. We're doing the, the series that uh, Scott talked about, the What We Believe study, and it's a, really just a great place to just to go back and to review some of the basic foundational truths of Scripture, what it is that we as Christians believe and embrace here at Grace Bible Church. During this time together, this week and the next three weeks, we're going to be going through a similarly flavored study, um, slightly different, and it's going to be called Because We Believe. So we have What We Believe, and then we have Because We Believe. And so um, they're compatible, um, they kind of supplement, complement each other, these two studies. And so I'd encourage you to be here, obviously, for both of those if you can. And if you happen to miss, whether it's the, the CT time or this time, we do record these. We put these on YouTube if you didn't know that, so you can definitely check us out on there. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, today we're going to dive in to our Because We Believe study. And uh, because I know we have some new faces and some of you that have are new to us in the last couple of years, uh, since we've kind of done this before, uh, I'd like to just kind of begin by giving you a brief very brief history of Grace Bible Church, how we came to be, and what um, this church actually kind of values um, or emphasizes, and so let's just kind of get into that just quickly, uh, and then we'll talk about the what this is on the screen here, this um, gather, grow, give, and go. So Grace Bible Church, this particular local body of believers, not necessarily in this building, but this body of believers has been, has been around, it's been called Grace Bible Church uh, since the early 1980s. Some of you weren't born yet, <laughs> but it was the 80s, that fantastic time when, anyway, but <laughs> uh, the 1982, I believe, I think I'm telling you right, was about the, um, the time when it began and uh, started, it met in different places around uh, Rockwell and eventually moved to this property and uh, met in what's now the fellowship hall and then they added some buildings and all of that but I didn't want to talk to you about the buildings because the building's not the important part the building is not Grace Bible Church it's the place where you Grace Bible Church meets so the church is the people the church is this community of believers who assemble in this particular location um, but Grace Bible Church this particular grouping of believers um, has been kind of meeting regularly for about 40 years. And in the name, Grace Bible Church, really is a tip-off to the two things that we really value as a church body that we want to emphasize. And so the other elders and I, um, which, by the way, I'm one of the elders. Scott, who did announcements, is another elder. We also have Tommy and Joey. So we have a, a, we're an elder-led church, a non-denominational church. Um, but what we have... Uh, inherited from those in leadership before us and that we want to continue to promote uh, within this local group um, like I said it's right there in the name grace and Bible okay so the Bible is really important and we believe that that this collection of writings that was assembled over several centuries by 40 ish human authors actually is the Word of God and it is God's Word for us and it gives us everything that we need for uh, application, for life, for godliness, for uh, instruction, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. This book contains what we need, what God has given us um, to, to help us in this journey. Okay? It helps us to understand salvation. It helps us to understand what, what we're talking about, what we believe. But it also, it helps us with what we're going to be talking about here. Because we believe, what's next? What do we do with that information? So the Bible is very central to what we, um, what we cling to as far as this local group of believers. We believe the Bible is very important. We can't do without that. Okay, it's our primary source text. It's where, 
you know, what we teach from. If you were here last year, uh, we were working through the gospel of Matthew, and uh, we actually never did finish it. We're going to come back to that. Uh, but we're, we're teaching through the Bible. We believe it's all useful. It's all there for us to, to learn from, to apply, and to grow in. So all of that said, that's kind of a little bit of history of Grace Bible Church. Um, but I want to also talk about the grace in, end of it as well. So when they chose the name Grace Bible Church, uh, it's because we want to emphasize the, the huge importance of grace in Christian teaching. You know, there's lots of different interpretations and people who, uh, churches and denominations and things that um, to a greater or lesser degree incorporate grace in their teaching. But what we see as we study through the Bible that it is all from one end to the other, Genesis to Revelation, is a revelation of God's grace. Okay, what does that mean? Well, grace, um, you may have heard this before, very simple working definition of grace is unmerited favor. So think about it as getting something good that you did not earn or even deserve. It's a gift that is given not in return for services rendered. It's not a payment, but it is a, a gift. Grace is a gift that you did not earn. And throughout the pages of Scripture, we, we come to understand that the God of the Bible is a gracious God. He extends grace. Um, no clearer example of that in Scripture than John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he did what? He, he gave his only begotten son, his unique one-of-a-kind son, Jesus, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that is grace. I mean, that's a spotlight on it right there. So you and I, and what we emphasize here as Grace Bible Church, is that the message of the, the Bible is a message of grace, that God, not because we deserve it or because we can earn it, but God, out of his great love for you and me, sent his son Jesus at great personal cost to himself, sent him to earth to come and to die in my place to pay the penalty that my sin deserves so that I can lay hold of that gift through faith and receive eternal life. Relationship with God. Heaven is my home. I mean, lots of things that come into that. So grace is a big emphasis as far as what we believe here at Grace Bible Church. So the Bible, very central. Grace teaching, very central. Um, and so as we get ready to embark on this study because we believe um, I realize uh, today I'm talking to mostly, probably people who, who believe, okay? Most of you are here uh, because you believe, because you, at some point in your life, have, have put your faith and trust and confidence in Jesus for salvation. There came a point in your life, at some point, when you realized that, listen, I'm a sinner, I'm separated from God, uh, my eternal destination is not heaven, and, and, and that I have this sin debt that I cannot pay. And you came to understand at some point that Jesus paid that debt for me. And then at some point, you hopefully you have done this, at some point you have laid hold of that gift. You've received it by faith through believing it. Okay? So again, John 3.16 says that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever, what? believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life so that's how we lay hold of that gift hopefully you have laid hold of that gift okay and if you have then you have eternal life you on that based on that one-time faith now have eternal life so that brings the real up, up a really interesting question now what i laid hold of that gift as a second grader some of you might have even been younger than that. Some of you were adults. But at some point, hopefully, you laid hold of that gift. You believed, and, and you were saved. You were born again. But something happened to me. It probably happened to you, too, that God did not immediately take you home to be with him. Okay, if you were here today, <laughs> okay, God is, if you're a saved person, 
um, there's an interval, there's sort of a gap between the moment when we got saved and then the moment we go to be with Jesus. So whether that's we're going to go meet Jesus when we pass away, or if he comes back to get us, okay, we're sort of in this waiting period, this interval. And so what now? I mean, what am I supposed to do? I'm just kind of hanging out, waiting on Jesus. I believe in him. My, my eternal destination is secure. But like now what? I mean, what do I do? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in this series, Because We Believe. So we're going to talk about some activities, and, and maybe more than activities, it's more like attitudes that go with the activities that should characterize what we as believers are about in this interval. Like as we wait for Jesus to come back, as we wait on him, whether we go be with him through death or he comes back to get us, whatever that looks like in this interval, like what should characterize our, our activity, our thinking? Um, and these are things that we're going to talk about. Gathering, growing, giving, and going. I think those really provide a summary of the types of activities, the types of thinking, types of attitudes that really should govern our time that we have left. Um, now, we're going to talk a little bit about where do we get these things from. We're going to dive into some passages today. We're going to look at um, some things that the Bible has to say uh, about these topics. Uh, but understand as we say them, whether we're talking about gathering, like we're doing today, whether we're talking about growing, whether we're talking about giving, whether we're talking about going, whatever one of those things we're going to talk about, understand these are things that we believe we do because we are saved, not things that we do to be saved. Does that make sense? So how are we saved? We're saved by grace, that free gift, that we lay hold of through faith. Okay, we're not saved by gathering. We're not saved by growing. We're not saved by giving or going. None of those things supplement or complete the salvation process. It's by grace through faith. But because we believe, these are things that we should be about. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So I'd like to invite you to turn your, in your Bibles with me uh, to the book of Acts. And we're going to be in chapter 2 in just a moment. Uh, Acts chapter 2. And um, so Acts chapter 2 is really cool. And the reason we're turning there, some of you already know this, why we're going to Acts chapter 2. Because it's in Acts chapter 2 that we see the birth of this thing called the church. Okay, prior to Acts chapter 2, there really was not a church. There was not, and I'm not talking about buildings, but I'm talking about grouping, that grouping of believers who have a common faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, this, Acts chapter 2 really is when the church took off. Okay, when Jesus died and was buried and rose again, he had this small community of disciples but they were even like puzzled as to what to do. And it wasn't until Jesus rose that they began to get it. And he said, y'all hang on. A few days later, I'm going to send a helper, which is the Holy Spirit. And he said, and, and I want you to wait. Don't do anything until then. So I want you to wait. And on that day, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit and we'll send this helper. And then y'all will have direction. Okay, you will have enablement. You'll have direction. You will have everything that you need to do to be the church. And so Acts chapter 2 is when that happened. The, whole, the Holy Spirit came and came upon and indwelled these disciples. And it was on that day in Acts chapter 2 that the apostle Peter, who formerly had been this like kind of a bumbling, sort of stick your foot in your mouth kind of guy, right? I mean, he's always messing things up. But on this particular day, based on the, the influence and the indwelling, the filling of the Holy Spirit, Peter stood up and delivered a gospel message to those who were gathered in Jerusalem. And on the basis of that message, many believed and were added to the church. So it began on that day. It was birthed on that day. And so when we... Look in Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to skip down to about verse 40. Um, it says, with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. 
verse 41, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day, meaning to the church, about 3,000 souls. So wow, they went from like 12 to like 3,000 in just a matter of a few minutes. But it doesn't stop there. It says that this new, living, vibrant community of Jesus following people, they immediately began to do something. And it mentions four things that they did. And when we read it, you know, not everything in the Bible is a good example to follow. Did you ever notice that? You know, not everything in the Bible is like an example to copy. Okay, it'll say, so-and-so did such-and-such, and and that was a bad idea, (laughs) right? Well, this is different. It says this is what they did, and it's spoken of positively. Like, it's like, ding, 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 pay attention. This is a good example to follow. These guys got it right. Okay, these guys and girls, these men and women who are coming to faith, they began to do these things, and you know what? This was, this was a positive. And it says, verse 42, this is what they did. It says they devoted themselves okay, to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And it says all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, notice that word, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, okay, attending the temple together, there's that word again, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So, as we kind of look at this passage, what we see is that immediately when this church, when the church began um, and was birthed, that they began to participate in certain types of activities, and the one kind of theme that runs through all of that is that they did them together. They did them personally, face-to-face, geographically present in the same place at the same time, But not just attending together, but with a commonality of purpose, direction, and activity that flowed out of that common purpose. So they weren't just like in the same spot, okay, checking the little box saying, okay, I'm here. But they they gathered together, they interacted face to face, they agreed on things. I'm sure they had disagreements, but there were some key things that they agreed upon And they mutually acted in each other's best interest, and they, and this is a key thing, they, their time together was participatory in nature. Okay, you with me? So they showed up, not just to show up, but they showed up to meet one another's needs and to interact personally, face to face, in a way that was meaningful and contributed to the good of this thing that they belonged to, the church. And so part of that is that, so the way that we're summarizing it here, gathering, growing, giving, and going. So these are some, some things. This is, this is our acronym. I think it pretty well kind of covers the, the gamut of what they're doing. Um, you could probably summarize it other ways. But, so we see they're gathering. But they're gathering in a participatory kind of way. Um, some other interesting things about this passage um, I, you know, I've read this, I don't know how many times, and I never noticed this till just yesterday when I was reading this passage. It says, verse 42, it says, they, now I'm reading from the ESV, I don't know if yours is different, but it says, they devoted themselves. That's, that really says something to me. They devoted themselves. These believers d- said, all right, I'm going to participate Right, I'm going to participate in a meaningful way. I'm going to devote myself. Nobody's making me do it. It's not under compulsion. It's not like anybody's beating a whip and saying, hey, you better get busy. No, they wanted to do it, and they did it, and it was good. But it was them deciding for themselves, listen, this is meaningful, this is important, and I want to do it. 
count me in. And so they devoted themselves to these key things that were important. Teaching, the fellowship. The fellowship, by the way, means, uh, it's the word koinonia. It means partaking. It means sharing together. Uh, so they devoted themselves to the teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking of bread. So they're eating together um, and, they're, and they're praying together. So they're participating in these things together. All right, so gathering. Sometimes I feel like um, 21st century American Christianity, we kind of get a different sort of vibe, like a different kind of idea that, okay, we just, to, to be the church, we just kind of, you know, show up once in a while. We just kind of show up on a Sunday morning, and that's sort of cool, and, um, and it is good. It is good to do that, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because you're here, right? <laughs> you know, if you're here, you kind of saw some value in it. Um, but, but sometimes I think there are folks, that, I mean, we kind of get this idea where um, that's the sum total of all the spiritual activity that's in my week. Does that make sense? So, like, going to church is great. Getting together, we do kind of a Bible study together. That's wonderful. But, but if that's kind of the sum total of the entire spiritual content of my week, well, it's, it's kind of fallen short uh, by contrast, okay, because they're not only showing up, but they're participating. They're doing something with what they're learning. And that something is they're ministering to each other's needs. So don't, so don't miss that. So it's, it's gathering, but it's gathering with a purpose that goes beyond just attendance. Um, I'd like to look at another passage. You'll turn with me, go backwards to the book of Matthew just for a moment. Um, now let's look at Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. And these, are, these will be familiar words probably to many of you. This is uh, Jesus talking to his disciples. So this sort of core group of followers. And he says to them, um, actually let's just go down to 19. He says, again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my father. <clears throat> excuse me, by my Father in heaven. For where two, are th two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And, and so this is interesting, um, not only because it contains a promise, Jesus is saying where, okay, where two or three of you are gathered in the same place, in my name, I will be there. Okay, there's, a, so there's this promise. But the thing that, other thing that makes this really significant is the context of the promise. If, you, if we were to go back and read through chapter 18, it's really all about the messiness and the drama and the, just those sticky, messy situations that happen when you get people together in the same place. They disagree. They sin against each other. They hurt each other's feelings. They stir up conflict and strife and there's problems and you sin against me and I sin against you and I got my feelings hurt and you got your feelings hurt. And so the easiest thing for us to do is to what? Part ways. It's the easiest thing to do is to part ways. But what we see is that Jesus is with his words and also with his example saying, listen, that's the easiest way, but this is God's way. And it involves togetherness. Where two or three of you are gathered in my name, okay, in my name, for his purposes, I will be there because it is important to him. God is relational. Did you know that about God, that God is relational? Sometimes we think about God as this very distant, alone, sort of a being that's just very detached from any interactions with others he's just kind of like way off like in a you know way up in heaven and he, he might as well just be in another universe but that's not the nature of God that we get from the Bible God is relational he enjoys being together even when it's sticky and messy and, and just it hurts God is relational in fact we go all the way back to Genesis when God created man 
He said, this is very interesting, he says in Genesis 2, let us create man in our image. Let us, the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. God is relational at his very core, at his very being. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're one, but not just geographically. They're not just in the same place. But they have a common agenda, a common goal, and they submit to one another for the good, um, for, for good, and for, um, how can I say this? They, they have a, an agreed upon way forward that all of them meaningfully participate in. Does that make sense? And so God says, let us, let us make man in our image, and in the image of God, he created them, the Bible says. So not only did, is God relational, he has created us to be relational. And so as the church body, we are to be relational. And even when it's sticky, messy, not convenient, takes a lot of time, and so chapter 18, if you look through the chapter 18 of Matthew, it's a lot of this, you know, well, if my brother sins against me, what do I do? Well, if this person does it, what do I do? Okay, it's God's way forward and how to be intentionally relational with other believers, even when it's hard. And in the context of that, Jesus says, listen, where two or three of you are gathered together, there I will be among you. That is important to me, and I'm going to show up in that situation and I'm going to be with you and in you and for you and that's a wonderful promise um, turn with me over to the book of Hebrews quickly we'll look at our last passage Hebrews chapter 10 in Hebrews chapter 10 again a passage that you probably read before uh, or you've heard before Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25 uh, reads like this. It says, let us, uh, and so the author of Hebrews is talking to Christians, believers. He says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the interesting thing about the book of Hebrews is we read this. Okay, the author of Hebrews, and I don't know if it's Paul. I kind of like to think it's Paul, but I don't know. But I almost imagine Paul or somebody like Paul, and he's saying, look, there, there are many of you who are getting out of the habit of meeting together. You need to understand that that is not God's will for you. Okay, physically, personally, face-to-face, interaction with other believers that that is that is God's will for his for his people but he says like okay some of you're getting out of that habit and he's and he's really saying listen there's a couple of benefits there's a couple of things that really can only happen in the context of gathering do you see what they are if you look at the passage well the, the one of those things is what it says that they when they get together it's for the purposes of encouraging. Okay, hopefully when you meet with other believers, that you and they are mutually encouraging to one another. Sometimes some believers I've been around, um, kind of, you know, maybe having a bad day, right? Like I have a bad day. You know, a lot of times my wife is an encouragement to me. Sometimes she's having a bad day, and I'm an encouragement to her. <laughs> Sometimes I'm having a bad day, you're an encouragement to me. Sometimes you're having a bad day, and I'm an encouragement to you. Sometimes you're having a bad day, and you're an encouragement in how you handle it to me. Like, there have been some people, like, you ever just seen some believers, and they're just going through the worst time in the world, and yet they have joy. And that's contagious. Oh, it's awesome. But we can't take the benefit from that if we don't what? If we're not together. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, gathering is so important because that's when and where you encourage one another. But not only that, if we back up 
just beheaded that, there's one other benefit to gathering. He says that we may stir one another up. I love that word. Think about like stirring the pot. Not stirring the pot. <laughs> Not stirring each other up to strife or contention or gossip or, you know, just stirring up trouble. Not that kind of stirring up. But stirring up, it says, one another to love and good works. You know, we have a word for that in Christianese. <laughs> it's probably not a real word, but we say it. Um, I mean, it is a real word, but the way we use it in Christianity, we say accountability. That's accountability. Stirring one another up to love and good works. So if I'm trying to do my Christian thing over here by myself, there are some things that probably would not occur to me that I ought to be doing or that I ought not to be doing. But it's because... I'm looking at you, I'm listening to your words, I'm seeing your example, I realize, hey, maybe I'm off track. Or maybe you tell me, you say, hey, Jason, you're off track. That's called accountability, and we can only have that when we're, guess what, together, right? When we isolate ourselves, we miss, we miss accountability, we miss encouragement, uh, we miss fellowship and all those sorts of things. All right, so as we kind of wrap this all, kind of bring this back home, when we think about because we are saved people, because we're waiting on Jesus to come back for us, right? We're waiting to go be with him. What, what should we be doing in the meantime, in this gap? Well, one of those things is gathering, okay, in a meaningful, participatory kind of way. But you and I know that we, we uh, live in a culture, and we live in a world with lots of influences that, and, and, and just life that sort of pushes us in the other direction, don't we? There are lots of things that try to keep us from doing the thing that's going to be spiritually productive for us. Um, I was listening to a podcast, uh, it's been some time ago now, but it was, uh, Corey Newhoff has a Christian, Christian leadership podcast, and uh, he mentioned just a, a, like 10 things, and he just said, hey, on the topic of gathering, he says, listen, these are some real things that are going on right now in America, uh, even among Christians, that are really just sapping the life out of Christians and, and as far as their ability to gather and to connect in a meaningful participatory kind of way and uh, I'll just share them with you we're not going to talk about all of these uh, but he just mentioned a few complications that really have an influence or bearing on us you know maybe not doing that as often as we as we could um, he mentions for example that as a nation as a culture Okay, we really enjoy greater affluence, and with greater affluence, greater income, lots more opportunities for things like travel, for instance. Um, just, I mean, and I don't have to have a show of hands here, but uh, if I were to ask you, how many of you today um, have more income and uh, live a, like a more, how can I say it? like a better lifestyle than you did when you were a kid. Okay, how many of you as a kid were poor and now are not as poor as you were when, when you were growing up? Okay, that's probably most of us, right? Most everybody, I think, could say, okay, today I'm probably better off financially. I'm able to do more things than I could when I was, you know, growing up. Most Americans can say that. And with more <coughs> options, with more income, okay, we have more opportunity to do things and with more opportunity to do things there's just draws from everywhere you know I don't have to just stay home and do free stuff anymore right I can go on vacation I can golf I can fish I can hunt I can go here I can go there and I can do this and so what happens is we say yes to those things and it's fun to say yes and they're not bad things but we say yes 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 and then when it comes time to gather I'm tired, you know? Or, and so um, kind of in that same category, kids' activities. I love doing stuff with my kids, but compared to when I was a kid to now, kids have so many options. I mean, you can take them to dance. You can take them to swim. You can take them to this activity and that sport and this travel ball and all this kind of, these lessons and all this kind of stuff. And those things are not bad. They're great. I love giving my kids opportunities, you know, guitar lessons, whatever it might be. Those things are wonderful. But what happens if you're like me as a parent, you get to 
through a week of like every day we got to be here we got to do this we got this we got this doctor's appointment we got the kid to go to this practice and blah 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 and I get to Sunday and I'm just exhausted and the last thing I want to do is meaningfully participate in the gathering together and so again it's not bad it's just it's just the world we live in we just need to be aware of it um split families and custody arrangements this is not to cast blame on anybody please don't think i'm saying that but the reality in which we live half of the homes that children grow up in are split family homes they're custody arrangements and all that kind of stuff and it makes it so hard to gather regularly meaningfully it's it's hard i know it's hard but it's just something we need to be aware of. It's not that like we can fix it. We kind of are where we are, but, but it's just something that it's, it's, it's a cultural thing that it's just kind of where we are at. Um, online options, uh, self-directed spirituality. You know, there's a reason that God has designed us to be in a face-to-face relational body of believers um, and not just do things digitally. Um, those things are wonderful they're wonderful additions and supplements to what we do in person. Um, but self-directed spirituality is kind of dangerous. Um, you know, <laughs> I was just thinking about that this week. Um, if you have kids, I don't know how many of you have, like, young kids or teens. Picture for a moment, you give your teenager or your preteen $100. And you said, all right, son, daughter, I'm going to drop you off here at Walmart or food line or wherever and I want you to take this in I want you to get everything you're going to eat for the next week go on I'll be here in the car you just go ahead (laughs) what are they going to come out of the store with okay nine out of ten kids are going to come back to the car and what are they not going to have they're not going to have any vegetables they're going to have skittles and starbursts and coca-cola and you know all this kind of stuff and they're going to come out And they're going to eat it in about the first day, and they're going to be on such a sugar high, and then they're going to crash, and then they're not going to have anything to eat for the rest of the week, right? Nine out of ten. Now, every once in a while, you got that one kid who's like, I'm little Mr. or Miss Responsible, and I'm going to buy broccoli and apples and, you know, whole grains, and they are not normal, okay? (laughs) But yet... A lot of folks approach their Christianity in a similar way. They say, well, I can just kind of pick and choose from a buffet of options, and I'll just, I'll, I will digest, for lack of a better word, I'm going to ingest, digest things that, okay, that I enjoy. It just makes me feel good, and I will pick and choose with no accountability. I will pick and choose what I think works for me, and um, do they usually choose wisely? Okay, sometimes, but not most of the time. And so um, the church body, the face-to-face interaction where there's mutual encouragement and accountability helps guard against making poor choices Okay, when it comes to spiritual direction. And so, anyway, we don't have time to talk about all of these things. Um, But um, I do want to kind of wrap it back up and just kind of say this. Um, There's a reason why the Bible emphasizes gathering together as a group of like-minded, same direction, participating believers. Uh, And that is because, okay, it reveals it to us that it's God's will. And it is God's will for us because He is relational. Okay, God is relational. He's created us to be relational. That is when it works best. He's designed it that way. He's designed the church and us to be part of the church because that provides a spiritual family. There's protection, there's accountability, there's help, there's encouragement, all of that in the spiritual family. And it's in that spiritual family where face-to-face we can have discipleship and accountability. Okay, We haven't gotten to Matthew 28 yet in our other study, but many of you know what's in Matthew 28. It's called the Great What? Great Commission. And Jesus says, Go, therefore, and make what? Disciples of all nations. And so, discipleship, followers of Jesus, that's what we're called to make. It's in the context of the church body 
where disciples are made. You don't make disciples outside of the structure that God has created. So discipleship, accountability, spiritual protection. And here's somewhere we're going to go in this study in the next month as we go through this. The church body, you may or may not know this, but God has gifted each and every one of you who believe with certain spiritual gifts, talents, abilities, resources that he has put on deposit with you to use for the benefit of the others in that group. Okay, so God has gifted me to love you with certain things. He has also gifted you to love each other with the same and some different gifts and talents and abilities and things. And so the church is the place, that I, I, again, not necessarily the building, but within this grouping of believers, that's the place where those things are employed the best and the most meaningfully. And so with all of that, we'll close. Gathering, growing, giving, and going for sort of summary principles of what we believe at, at Grace Bible Church that was what we believe that Christians, okay, that we're to be about as we wait for Jesus. So let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for just being able to be together today. Thank you for your goodness, for your love that you've extended to us, uh, especially through your son Jesus. We thank you for the salvation that he brings to us that we lay hold of by faith. Thank you for that great gift, that great demonstration of your grace. Father, direct us through your Holy Spirit uh, on how we should walk, what we should be doing, or what we should be about in the meantime. Lord, as we wait for your coming, we consider how to love one another uh, as we're here. Lord, we thank you for this body. Thank you for Grace Bible Church. Um, and it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, we do have a moment. If you, um, We're going to be doing some risers up here. A couple of you young strapping men would like to come up uh, and help.